Good morning, church family. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm glad you all are here this morning. I know a lot of folks are probably at home today watching on uh, YouTube or Facebook uh, due to the weather, but I'm glad you all braved the elements to come out and worship together. For those of you watching at home, we miss you. I hope to see you next week. If you have your copy of God's Word, I pray you do. I'd invite you to open to Matthew chapter 6. It's on page 811 of your Black Pew Bible. Page 811 in that Black Pew Bible. And if you don't have a Bible, that Bible is yours. You can take it home as a free gift from Oak Grove Baptist Church. Uh, We only ask that you read it and you obey it. Uh, In 2016, my daughter Amanda uh, came to me and she said, Dad, um, myself and five other girls, uh, and when I first heard that, I said, wait a minute. I knew something was was stirring. She said, we've been saving our money, and we want to take a trip. And I said, okay, where to? And she said, Iceland. And and I said, Amanda, people flee from Iceland. Why on earth would you want to go to a place called Iceland? Uh, uh, They're calling for some sleet and rain today. I don't even want to go out in it. I can't imagine going to a land named after ice. But she wanted to go. They went to Reykjavik, uh, several different places, had a great time. But after she left, I was asleep on the couch. I said, now listen, I don't care what time you get there. You call me. You call me when you get there, and and I want to know that you're there. And when she got there, uh, I was about about 4 o'clock in the morning, our time. And I heard a sound that I'd never heard before. It was this this crazy sound on my phone. I didn't know what it was. I thought it was an alarm going off. I looked at it, and it said FaceTime. Well, I picked it up, and I slid it across, and there's Amanda. Four o'clock in the morning our time. It was about 10 o'clock in the morning uh, over in Iceland. Uh, And and she was crying, and she said, Daddy, I miss you. And I said, well, sweetheart, I can't just hop in the car and come and get you. I'm like, you are stuck in Iceland. But it was good, and it was such a cool tool, I had no idea that an iPhone would do something like that. I felt like George Jetson talking to Mr. Spacely. I was like, wow. But the cool thing about FaceTime is it, it was a, a useful tool in that Amanda was able to speak to me, I was able to speak to her, but better than that, we were able to see each other. And that was really cool. We were able to be face-to-face, even though she was thousands of of miles away, and I appreciated that. Do you know that FaceTime is biblical? Do you know that, that FaceTime is mentioned all through the Bible in prayer? Because we can spend time, quality time, with our Heavenly Father and have FaceTime with Him. You don't believe me? In the Old Testament, Abraham, he encountered the presence of God, and when he did, Genesis 17, he fell on his face. He was in the presence of the Lord. Moses spoke to God face to face, Exodus 33. In fact, on Mount Sinai, he spent so much time with God when he came down, he was glowing that the people couldn't even look at him. He he radiated from being so close to the face of God. In in Judges chapter 6, Gideon saw the angel of the Lord face to face. David wrote Psalms about face time with God. Psalm 27, do not hide your face from me. Psalm 51, that great prayer of repentance, hide hide your face from my sin. So all throughout the Bible, the Bible talks about the face of God and and how we can have that that quality relationship with him where we can come to him face to face. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament came face to face with the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, on the road to Damascus. His life was changed forever forever. John, on the island of Patmos, uh, he, he saw Jesus face to face, and he penned those words in the book of Revelation. He fell at his feet as if he were a dead man. Needless to say, face time with God is life-changing. And so today we're starting a new series called 21 Days of Prayer and Fasting, and we're going to look at Jesus' teachings on both disciplines. Now, without question, prayer is both fascinating and frustrating at the same time. And no one said amen. Somebody said amen. I heard it. Yeah. Prayer can be a very frustrating thing because it's a spiritual discipline. And any discipline that we encounter 
is, is difficult because it, it's, we have to change the way we do things and discipline ourselves to do other things. Uh, prayer is communication with God. But for many Christians, it's the biggest struggle in their life. It's hard work. It is hard to maintain a consistent prayer life. But listen, prayer is the most powerful force on earth. Amen. It is the most powerful force on earth. Now, it came naturally to Jesus. But Jesus spent a lot of time praying. A lot of time praying. And, and it always amazes me how Christians don't utilize that power in their life. When we see Jesus throughout the, the, the Bible praying, right, even on the cross he was praying. Right before he went to the cross, he goes into the Garden of Gethsemane and he prays. That, that, if, that, if you knew that you were going to be executed in hours... What would be the last thing you would do? <laughs> That's the church answer, yes. But actually, it's the real answer. That's what we should do, because that's exactly what Jesus did. There are many times that praying is as much of a battle as it is a blessing. And, and sometimes we just, it just seems like we're trying to get something out of God, when really what prayer truly is is getting to know God better. You see, prayer is not trying to get something out of God that we don't have yet. Prayer is getting into a deeper relationship with the one who created us. Now, there's one thing that we all have in common when it comes to prayer. We all want to crack the code. We all want the password. God, how can I pray so that you will give me what I want? I heard a story one time about a, a Princeton University PhD student who went to Albert Einstein and he said, what is left in the world for original dissertation research? And Albert Einstein said to him, find out about prayer. Someone must find out about prayer. So over the next four weeks, we're going to do that. We're going to go to the Bible and find out about prayer from the greatest expert on praying who ever lived, the one who invented it, Jesus Christ. We're going to be reading out of Matthew's uh, Gospel, chapter 6, going to read verses 5 through 8. It's up on your screen. It's on page 811 of your Black Pew Bible. And as always, I'd like to ask you to stand, if you're able, for the reading of the Word of God. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 5. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray... Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Father God, we come before you this morning, Lord, just humbled to be in your holy presence. We thank you, Lord, that... Because of what Jesus has done for us, not only can we have abundant and eternal life, Lord, but we can come before you face to face through the powerful privilege of prayer. God, I pray that my brothers and sisters here today, if they don't have a robust prayer life, that they would start today disciplining themselves to speaking to you on a regular basis crawling up on your lap and calling you Abba Daddy because you've given us that wonderful privilege. Lord God, I pray that your spirit will be among us today. I pray that he will be teaching us, opening our eyes, opening our hearts, opening our ears to what you have to tell us. We thank you, Lord, for who you are and we thank you for what you're making us. In Jesus' holy name I pray, amen. You may be seated. In Luke chapter 11, the disciples have been with Jesus for some time. And, and they come to him, and they don't say to him, Jesus, teach us how to preach. That's what I wish I could have done. Lord, teach me how to preach. They didn't say, teach me how to lead a Bible study. They didn't say, teach me how to run a church organization. They didn't say, teach me how to be a deacon. They said, teach us how to pray. Don't you find that interesting? I find that very interesting. 
that they're sitting at the feet of the one who created all things, including themselves. And the one thing that, that they notice about him is his amazing prayer life. It's as if Jesus needs this in his life. And they're saying, you know, we pray, but it's not effective like it is when you pray. What is it that you're doing different? You see, they had listened to him pray. They, they had watched him pray. And his prayers were, were so different than theirs. Uh, so he teaches them these important principles about prayer, that prayer is not to get what we want from God, but to get what God wants for us. And in order to do that, he gives the disciples some basic principles about prayer. First, he says to talk to God secretly. I think the, the amazing thing is the first thing Jesus talks about is not how to pray, but where to pray. It may sound strange, but the truth is you can pray anywhere. Believe it or not, you can pray anywhere. Uh, many people think that, and I used to think this too, before I became a pastor, that, that the pastor had the red phone in his office. Uh, pastor, I need you to pray for me. And you know, that's a great blessing as a pastor when somebody comes to you. Uh, Richard, Adam, Matt, uh, Mitchell, you ask any of them. When somebody comes and says, listen, I, I need you to pray for me. But that's, a, that's a wonderful privilege. That's a great thing. But believe it or not, I don't have the bat phone in my desk drawer. I don't have that, that hotline uh, that nobody else has. I have the ability to pray just like you do. Uh, I have the same power in my prayers that you have because it's the power of the Holy Spirit. And every believer can access that same power. We can, we can connect with God anywhere, but Jesus tells us to go to a secret place. Now, that's just where we can experience our greatest intimacy with God in a unique way, and that is in private and not in public. Someone once asked me, where in the Bible does it say that God wants to have a, 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 you know, a relationship with, with us? Well, I believe it says it right there. When Jesus says, get away in secret and talk to your heavenly Father. That, that is an intimate relationship. And this is why the first advice Jesus gives us is this. And when you pray, he doesn't say if you pray. He doesn't say if you decide to pray. He says when you pray. This means he's expecting us to do it. If we are believers in Jesus Christ, we will pray. Amen. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. So again, it's not a suggestion. Now, that, that word hotan in the Greek, it means used of things which one assumes will actually occur. Jesus is assuming that in the life of a believer, prayer is an essential element because it was essential in his life. And he says, if you're going to follow me, you need to follow and do the things that I do. Uh, believe what I'm telling you because my word is truth. You need, if I need to pray, how much more do you all need to pray? That's what Jesus is telling us. If that's where he got his power and his direction, how much more do we need it for our lives? It's exponential. It, 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 can't, it can't be uh, uh, discussed enough about how important prayer is in our lives. We need direction from the Lord. Now see, prayer is a spiritual discipline that requires humility. So does fasting. We're going to get to fasting in, in this series as well. Uh, because Jesus is in the Sermon on the Mount here in Matthew 6, and he's talking about giving, and he's talking about prayer, and he's talking about fasting. So we're going to get to that uh, in, in a couple of weeks. But, but it's a, a spiritual discipline that involves humility. You know what prayer and fasting uh, do? Prayer is to know God and to be known by God. And fasting is where you sacrifice something and replace it with God, whatever that thing is. And, and again, I'll expound on that in a few weeks. But if you go back 2,000 years into Jerusalem, there were a group of, of ultra-conservative hypocrites named Pharisees. Uh, they believed in rules and religion and, and, and regulations, but they didn't believe in relationship with God. So what they would do is they would pray. Uh, they loved to pray in, pray in two places. The first place was a synagogue, 
where everyone could hear their big liturgical prayers, and they loved to pray on the street corner, where people in public could hear them. And now, their timing was always impeccable because every afternoon sacrifices would be offered at the temple and a trumpet would be blown and would signal that it was time to pray. And wherever you were, you were expected to stop and pray. We should go back to that. I think we should. I think we should go back to, to blowing a horn and saying, okay, stop and pray. Maybe we can set our devices uh, for every hour and just offer up a, a, a prayer to the Lord. It doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be flowery language. It doesn't have to be lengthy. It just has to be heartfelt. But these guys were trying to showcase their spirituality. They were saying, look at how pious I am. I, I have heard some wonderful prayers in my life, and I pray if the Lord allows me, I'll hear many, many more. But, but I've heard some wonderful people pray, and they were not liturgical. Believe it or not, they were not in, in uh, Old English either. No these, no thys, no thous. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Uh, that's just not how you speak. And, and, and that's what a lot of people believe, is that when you get up to pray, especially pray publicly. Now, Jesus isn't con he's not condemning public prayer, because public prayer is all in the Bible. Jesus did it. It, it is proper in worship that we pray. It is proper in our lives that we pray. It is proper when you're in a restaurant to pray. In fact, I've told you before, that's one of the, the, the great witnessing tools is that when your server comes to the table, you listen when they say, hi, I'm Bill, I'm going to be your server. Listen for their name. Bill, we always pray before we eat. How can we pray for you? What a great witnessing tool that is. You don't know how many tears I've seen shed by, by folks at restaurants just because somebody cared enough to ask if they had a prayer concern. Now, most of the time... They do. And a lot of times they're unbelievers. But that means something to them. But you don't have to pray uh, in, in some great liturgical, ecclesiastical language. Just let it be the prayer of your heart. Just speak honestly and openly to the Lord. That's exactly what Jesus is telling us. He's telling us that we shouldn't get up like the hypocrites, like the actors, the people who are phony. He's telling us not to catch up on our private prayer life in public. And, and oftentimes, when we pray in public, it's, a, it's an overflow of how we pray in private. So you can tell a lot about a person. I'm not saying to judge somebody by their prayers, but I'm saying that oftentimes we can, we can see how much time they spend alone with the Lord when we hear their prayers. Uh, I remember of a, a story about a young lawyer who had just got a new office. And, and he was a little cocky, he was a little arrogant, and he was sitting in his, uh, behind his shiny new desk, he was waiting for his first client to walk in, when suddenly he heard footsteps coming down the hall and a knock at the door. Now he wanted uh, to look like he was a big, successful lawyer, so he pretended to be very busy. Uh, he told the man, come on in! And so as the man walked in, he picked up the phone and he carried on this fake conversation. He said, I'll have my secretary get to it today as soon as I can. You understand I have a very heavy schedule, but I do appreciate you calling. Call back in a few days, and I'll see if I can take your case. And as he hung up the phone, he looked at the man who he thought was his first client and said, now, sir, what may I do for you? And the guy said, I'm from the phone company. I'm here to hook up your telephone. <laughs> God does not want us to have fake conversations with him. He just wants us to come to him, to know him better, and, and to be heard. To be to hear from him, because that's how God speaks to us. That's how we grow in our faith. And so you ask yourself these questions when it comes to your own private prayer life. Number one, whose attention am I trying to get? Number two, who is it that I really want to hear my prayers? And number three, why am I praying to begin with? We all need to learn to talk to God secretly. Secondly, we need to learn how to talk to God sincerely. Jesus said that real prayer, a God-honoring prayer, is not just prayed secretly, but it's also prayed sincerely in verse 6. But when you go, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. 
Now, this is one practice that can radically change your life. Uh, and, and I say that because there's no spiritual, emotional, or mental substitute for spending time alone with God. Uh, if you're married, you know that intimacy is important. It's important for your relationship. Uh, there's, there's, you know, sometimes we pray and, and we don't get an immediate response from God, so we think he's not listening to us. Uh, my, my grandmother, Grace Testerman, that's who my baby is named for. In our family, she was a notorious talker. She liked to talk. Now, she was a sweet woman, and I loved her very dearly. But she would talk the ears uh, off of a wooden statue. Uh, and, and my grandpa was very soft-spoken, unless he was in the pulpit. You all think I'm loud. Uh, he, was, he was very quiet. He was a good listener. Uh, but Grandma would talk and talk and talk and talk, and he wouldn't say anything. And it was frustrating to her, and she'd say, Daddy, are you listening to me? And he would say, Honey, I ain't hard of hearing. I'm tired of hearing. Now, listen, God is never tired of hearing from us. He is never tired. Okay? And, and, and just because the answer doesn't come immediately does not mean that God does not hear your prayers. Amen. God knows what is best for us, and he wants us to come to him. And he wants us to have that, that intimate conversation with him. As I said in marriage, it's, it's, it's absolutely necessary in marriage to have that intimate conversation. And, and, and as a, a parent of a, of a three-year-old, I'm so grateful for my mom. Because there would be no date night. Uh, there would be no dinners without saying, don't put carrots up your nose uh, if it wasn't for my mom. We need those times to get away and to be together. And just like that, we need to spend time alone with the Lord because when we go to that secret place and, and we, we, we have that intimate conversation with God, it fosters sincerity. Where we can come to God with a sincere heart where we can go to God and, and we don't have to worry about people hearing what we say, where we're not looking for awards and we're not looking for applause or acclaim. It's just you and him. That's what he desires. Now, if you have something extremely sensitive, uh, something uh, extremely important that you need to talk about, you go to a secret place and talk to God about that. It, it would be almost like if, if you wanted to talk to somebody here at church and you would say, Hey, is there a place we can go where we can be alone where nobody can hear us? I need to talk to you about something. It's the same thing. God wants that sincerity in our prayers. Now, when we, when we do that, two things get under control right away. First, the clock is brought under control because what we say to God is nothing is more important to me right now than spending time with you. And the calendar is brought under control because we're saying to God, nothing is more important to me today than spending time with you. Do you have a secret place where you can go and spend time to be with the Lord? Do you have a designated place where you can go be alone with the Lord? It can be anywhere. It can be in your closet. It can be in your basement, your spare bedroom. But you need to have a place where you can meet God secretly so that you can show God that you mean business, that you want to hear from him and you want God to hear from you. Pray sincerely. Number three, we need to talk to God specifically. So Jesus goes a step further. He not only tells us where to pray, but he tells us what not to pray. Verse 7, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Now that word heard in Greek means to be taken seriously. So, if you want God to take your prayer seriously, he, remember that he is not moved by the, the, the quantity of words or the quality of words. Uh, he, he doesn't care about the language that we use. Uh, he doesn't care about the length of our prayers because none of that impresses God. Uh, I, I, I read a story about a Scottish pastor, and he was up in the pulpit, and he was, he was notorious for long, liturgical prayers. And if you know Scottish people, they're not always the most patient in the world. So he's, he's up praying, and one of the ladies in the congregation says, just call him father and ask him for something. 
And unfortunately, that's how a lot of prayers are. Uh, they just call him Father and ask him for something. Too many people just go through the numbers. Uh, just, you just, you just use church cliches. Just say what you've heard other people say. And, and, and that's not the kind of prayer that God is looking for. Uh, so many prayers are general rather than specific. In fact, the, the people pray sometimes with so many generalities that you, you wouldn't know if a prayer was answered even if it was. We need to be specific in our prayers. When we confess our sins to God, he doesn't just want to say, well, Lord, I've been a bad boy today. Just forgive me of everything. That's just a big blanket prayer. God wants specifics. If you, because every sin is first and foremost against God. If you've lost your temper, if you've lost your tongue, if you've lost your mind, uh, you, you, you went postal at work, you ruined your reputation, you ruined your witness, tell God those things. And he'll restore you. He'll forgive you. And he'll restore you. He wants us to pray specifically. You see, it's not how much we pray or say to God that causes him to hear our prayers. It's how you say what you say that gets his attention. And that's what Jesus tells us in verse 8. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Now, for some people, that's a demoralizing statement. Well, if God already knows what I need, why should I ask him? Well, that's the point. We're to go to him, and we're to ask him. So God is the only one who can answer our prayers. And so even though God knows what we need, he still wants us to come to him and ask him. I know that Gracie wants her bottle at 7 o'clock. But we're trying to get her off of that bottle. And so I wait until she comes to me and says, I want my baba. And it's like, okay, another night of babas. But I give it to her. I know she needs it. I know she wants it. But I want her to come to me. I want her to trust her father. And, and that's, that's what prayer is all about. It's not primarily about telling God what we need. Prayer is primarily for the purpose of getting closer to God and going deeper with God. See, when we come into God's presence, it's almost as if God is saying, don't bring me your shopping list. Don't bring me your organ recital, if you will. Praying for Aunt Bessie's kidney and Uncle John's liver. He knows these things. But we'll get to those later, God says. He says, come to me, bring me your heart, your love, your attention, and your affection. In other words, prayer is not primarily about getting things from God. It's about spending time with God. God communicates to us in many different ways. He communicates to us through his word, through circumstances, through other people, sometimes through his creation. But the only way that we can communicate with God is through prayer. There is no other way which we can communicate with him, which we can deepen our relationship with him, in which we can have intimacy with God. Now, once we understand that, our prayer life will be raised to a whole new level because it goes far beyond a shopping list. It's far beyond what we need and far beyond what we want. It is the primary way that God uses to develop a relationship and a deepening fellowship. That raises a big question. How much would you pray if you never needed anything. Because prayer is about desperation. And, and when, when somebody gets the phone call that you've got a disease, that you're getting a divorce, that you're getting fired, you find yourself in a desperate place and suddenly it's, Lord. And listen, God wants you to cry out to him during those times. But he also wants you to cry out to him and come to him when things are going wonderful, when things are going fantastic. He wants to hear from you every single day. He wants you to FaceTime him and say, Dad, I miss you. I want to spend time with you. I love you. Listen, for the next week, I want to give you some homework. I want you to discipline yourself to spend at least five minutes a day alone in a secret place talking to the Lord. I want you to get away from all distractions. Turn off your phone, get away from your computer, whatever it is, whatever devices you've got on. If you've got it on an Apple Watch, take it off. 
because somebody will text you during that time. Just, just give God five minutes. Just start with that. And then after that, spend time with the Lord, talking to him, loving on him, thanking him, because prayer is not a barrier that cannot be overcome. On October 14, 1947, a B-29 took off from the California desert. Attached to the belly of a bomber was the Bell X-1 experimental plane piloted by Chuck Yeager. At 25,000 feet, the X-1 dropped from the B-29. It fired up its own engines and quickly ascended to 40,000 feet. As the plane accelerated, it shook violently. At Mach 0.965, the speed indicator went haywire. Yeager's vision blurred and his stomach turned, and he thought that he was about to die. Suddenly, he heard a loud sonic boom that was followed by an eerie silence. That unbreakable barrier that people thought would never be broken was broken, and the aviation world celebrated. Now, for many of us, prayer seems to be an unbreakable barrier, but it's not. It's simply getting face time with God. Because of Jesus, we can have face time with God. Because the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, we can have intimacy with God. Jesus broke that barrier when he died on Calvary's cross. The sin barrier was broken, the veil was torn in half, and now sinful man had access to a holy God. Because Jesus took on flesh, we can spend time in his presence. Because Jesus sacrificed himself for our sins, we can enter into a relationship with the Father. Because we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we can experience the guidance of our good God in our daily lives. Just get face-to-face -face with God and watch how it changes your life. Let's pray. Father God, we give you praise and thanks that we can come before you in Jesus' name. And we can lift up our prayers, and we can lift up our praise, and we can lift up our petitions to you with the blessed assurance that you not only hear us, but you care about us. I think it's wonderful. I think it's amazing. I think it's stupefying that a holy God would be mindful of us. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for sending him on that rescue mission, rescuing us from sin, sorrow, and death, offering us the glories of heaven, not only when we're there, but here on earth. We thank you for the gift of your spirit. God, I pray for each one of my brothers and sisters. And, and, and as Christians, we all struggle with prayer. We all struggle with these spiritual disciplines. It, it takes time. It takes effort. It takes intentionality. But Lord God, I pray that, that we would come to you in that secret place. And that we would pray to you sincerely and specifically to the one who created all things and to the one who died to make us a new creation. Father, I pray for those here today that don't know you as Savior. I pray, Lord, that your spirit will work a miracle today in their hearts that you reveal to them the, the depth of their sin and the desperate need that they have for a Savior. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So God, I pray during this time of invitation that your Spirit would be working in the hearts of those who are far from you, Lord, bringing them into that relationship with you today. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to you and you would like to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, the Bible says he's faithful and just. He will do it. He will do it right here and right now. You can bring your sins. You can bring your sorrows. You can bring your guilt and your shame. And you can lay it down at the altar. You can give it to Jesus. And you never have to worry about it again because he already dealt with it at Calvary's cross. He offers you a free gift today of eternal life. Maybe you'd like to be baptized. You've already said yes to Jesus, but you never came forward you, you, to be baptized. You've never taken that step of obedient faith. Maybe you'd like to join our church, or you need someone to pray with you today. Uh, whatever your need, please come as the Spirit moves you.